Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. I'm very excited this week for the video. I get to talk about a brand new game. Well, it's been, they've been working on it for a while. Tales of Argosa. This is effectively low fantasy gaming version two or edition two, if you will. They've tweaked it to make it a little bit more, even, even more sword and sorcery, a little bit more gritty. And it's just a really fun game. This is about to go on Kickstarter soon. I don't have the exact date yet, but in the description below, there is a link you can follow to get notified. There's also a link to the playtest, the one that I'm going to be showing you in this video. So it's probably worthwhile to download that first and be following along. In any case, we'll take a look at the book. I'll give you my opinions on it, and I'd love to hear what you think. So let me know in the comments below what you think of Tales of Argosa. So there's a lot to cover here, so I'm going to go kind of quickly through the book, pointing out some of the key features that I like, and we'll jump in and talk about them. I just want to show you the cover here. I'm getting a little bit of glare, so beautiful black and white art, nice and simple. I really love the art in this. They're going to add more, change some of it and stuff like that. Obviously, this is a play test document, but as we stand, it's it's pretty nice. Standard table of contents, if you want to take a second to peek at that. But again, you can download the play test document. Link is in the description. Okay, so we get some information about what is the game, the core features that designers put in the game. You know, th what's nice about this is that it gives you an idea of what they were thinking. When you look at a lot of games that are being put out there, sometimes they're, you know, a complaint people will make is that they're too generic. They can do anything with it, which, yes, you definitely do a lot of stuff with this, but there is definitely a tone in this game, and I really like that. So character creation is kind of, by the standard way, is random. You roll for a lot of stuff, but obviously if you choose to, your group wants to pick, you can as well. You've got backgrounds that add to your character. You've got your attributes. So this is a little bit different because you've got kind of your standard ones, but perception and willpower have, re have uh, replaced wisdom. There's also an initiative stat. And you've got kind of a standard set of modifiers here. In addition to the regular stats, Tales of Argosa also uses a luck stat. So this is, you could think of as a saving throw, but it's also used for a few other things that we'll talk about later. It's real simple. It's basically 10 plus the character's level. And what you do is it's a roll under. So think about a first level character is going to have 11. But in certain circumstances, like let's say dodging out of the way of something, you might add your dex bonus to that. Say you have a plus two dex, which is what they say in the example in this thing. That gives you 13. Roll d20, 13 or under, you make it. What's interesting about it, though, is that every time you succeed in a luck check, your luck goes down by one. That makes it something that as the adventure is proceeding, it becomes more and more dangerous. I love how that pushes it forward and adds a bit of an edge to it. Higher level characters are going to have higher lucks to start with, of course, and they, that means they can go on longer and more dangerous adventures, but eventually everybody's luck will start to run out. All right, going into the races, we've got your humans, your dwarves, your elves, kind of standard stuff. There is half scorn, which I believe is unique to this setting. I've not seen them before. Going at the beginning of the class section, we're getting some information here. Here's one of the things that sticks out and I think a lot of people will like. Basically, your hit points are, you start with more hit points than you normally would in a lot of games because you start with your con, a lot of old school games anyways. You start with your con plus some, some modifiers based on your class and they go up slowly. So you kind of don't get this crazy hit point bloat, but you also don't start off super weak. If you go down in combat, there can be long-term injuries, which we will talk about for sure. And we talk about how you level up. Basically, each class has a, well, let's, let's walk through this. Let's just look at one of them. So let's look at the Artificer. So if we look at the Artificer, we've got, you know, our baseline stuff, what skills we have, what gear we start with. We've got our charts here that handle any abilities we might pick up as far as extra attack bonus and stuff like that. Our abilities are over here. And as we level up, we get to either roll or choose from various of these abilities. So you might get Troubleshooter, at most of the classes, if not all of them, might be all of them at third level, get a unique feature. So that's something that you can decide at your table. You just pick something for your character that makes sense. You discuss it with the game master and you have it. There is a list of kind of ones that the, the developer created. So if you don't have an idea or you want to use a standardized list, you can do that as well. Ninth level is basically the cap in this game. So you've got Artificer, you've got Barbarian, you've got Bard. Now, I should point out too that most of these classes don't have direct magic. You have you have a magic user class, and you've got 
a cultist, which is kind of a, a cleric analog, but they are the only ones that really directly have what I would call magic. Everybody else, it's, you know, like your bards and stuff. Bards aren't casting spells. So there's your cultist. There's some gods in here that you can choose from because the way the cultist works is your god's going to have certain tenets. And if you follow those tenets of your god, you'll have favor, which will then make it easier for you to use your cultist abilities, which are effectively spell casting kind of things. All right. Here we go. Your fighter is the best fighter in the in the group, you know, because in a lot of games you've got rangers, fighters, barbarians like you have here, but the fighter itself is a little bit kind of boring. The fighter here is pretty darn nice because, again, they've got their own set of skills. So if you choose to, if you want a really powerful, you know, or, or useful fighter, the fighter is probably the best, right? <laughs> We've got, and again, just like here, at third level, they get a unique feature. And I really like that, actually. It's one of those things that makes you think. This game has a lot of that, where the, the group is going to have to get together and think about how they want to run it. And I really like that, because that makes every table a little bit different. Here's your magic user. I'm going to point out another thing here, which is that a lot of games will talk about how magic is dangerous, and basically they just make you roll the cast, and if you don't succeed, you whatever. This game really has dangerous magic. We're going to jump into that in a second. So you got a monk class. Ranger. The ranger here is, you can do Beast Companion, but it's really kind of a wilderness fighter with tracker and stuff. I, I kind of like the ranger in here a lot. I think I'd use this style of ranger if I was running a game myself. Your rogue is your thief, assassin type, of course. So you've got kind of your standard stuff, right? So you're not coming into this game going, oh, I don't understand what any of this is. But at the same time, each thing is unique to this particular game and setting. I think they definitely added enough cool stuff to make it really stick out. All right, here's something I really like. And again, you can very easily, if you're playing with the group, just decide the connections. But I love having this kind of stuff in a game where everybody at the table gets to roll on this chart and make a connection to somebody else in the group. And they're fun, you know, like muscle for a crime boss joint research task, you know, so it's like it gives you a little bit of a background of how these characters may have worked together in the past and what their connection is. All right, here are that list. Remember I said there was a list of unique features if you don't want to create one or you can't think of one for your character. You have a lot of options here. Also, even if you don't want to use these, this will give you an idea of what at least the designer is considering what might be useful as, you know, what might be applicable, I should say. We've got a skill system. I'm going to talk for a second about the re-rolls, which is really interesting. Depending on your level, you get a number of re-rolls that can be used for various things per adventure, which is kind of neat. So first through third level, it's equal to your level. So if you're a first level adventurer, you can re-roll once during that adventure. And it does feel like when they're talking about adventure in here, that adventure is not going to be one session, not one sitting. It's an adventure is an adventure. You're going four days travel through the woods to a temple to steal some ancient treasure and getting back. Like that's the adventure. That might be four or five sessions of play. So it's not like you're getting tons and tons of re-rolls. It is a bit of meta currency, which some people like or don't like. I kind of like it when it's simple like this. and It doesn't dig too deep into it. Now we have our skills here we might use. And if you have a skill in something, then you basically just get effectively a bonus when you're trying to accomplish that task. There are some tasks that require the skill and those are noted. So like you might see a test that says like acrobatics with an asterisk and that means you have to have acrobatics to do it. All right, you know, then we have our equipment and encumbrance. This is a very complete game. You've got a lot of stuff in here, you know, food, lifestyle. A lot of it is, has detail where you need it and a lot of it is kind of abstracted where you don't. I think they did a good job in choosing what at least to my taste, what would be fun to play out and what would be easier just to roll for. When you look at your weapons, you've got your cost, your damage, you've got your range, then you've got your natural 19. So a lot of weapons will do something on a natural 19. A natural 20 in this game is a critical hit, but a natural 19 might also do something. Often they are special trauma, and then we've got special properties here. Which range weapons, you've got your armor, animals you can buy. And then we're gonna get into basically actions. So in the section called doing things, we get into kind of what you roll for, right? We all know how to just tell the GM what we wanna do and they adjudicate, but when do we need dice? So you've got a few different things. You've got your 
attack roll, which is effectively a d20, add modifiers equal to or beat an armor class. You've got skill checks or attribute checks, which are basically you're rolling under your attribute on a d20. If it's a skill check and you have that skill, you add one to your attribute. So let's say you've got a 14 dexterity and the skill is picking locks. It would count as a 15 for that test. Nice and simple. You can add modifiers. There's advice on here to how to do that, but that's basically how you're operating. Attack rolls, you're rolling high. Skill checks, you're rolling low, both of which are on a d20. The luck check we already talked about a little bit earlier, but there's something else cool in here that they put together called a montage. So basically, you have a series of tasks. What you do is you go around the table. Each player has their character make a check based on what they're doing as part of the overall plan. Enough good checks versus enough bad checks, and you do it. The other way, you don't. One final thing that I really like here, and we don't see a lot in D20 systems, I don't think, is we've got degrees of success and failure here. If you are rolling your attribute check and you succeed by more than half, so basically your attribute is 10 and you roll below 5, that's a great success. If you fail by more than 1.5, so if you rolled better than 15, then you have a great failure or a terrible failure, as it would be. <laughs> All right, as we jump into a section on encounters, you've got reaction rolls, which are pretty standard and cool in a lot of games these days. You also have an activity chart, which is very sweet. This is so nice, right? Because we can roll, we can get this, the story makes more sense, or it makes it easier to tell the story, I should say, if you are, you roll, okay, I rolled some ogres passing through the woods. I rolled the reaction. They are friendly. And then I roll what they're doing and maybe they're wounded, right? Or, or healing wounds. So it's like, well, they're friendly because they need our help. And then that helps tell the story. Yes, you can just make that up yourself, but sometimes it's nice to have this to keep you going. One thing this game really seems to push is the idea of the emergent style of play. There's lots of things in here that you can roll as you go, discuss with your players and look at charts and stuff and kind of make it go as you're playing as opposed to planning everything out step by step. Okay, jumping into combat, of course, we have the initiative ability score that I said. Effectively, you take turns rolling initiative. So, you know, you can definitely have somebody at the table with the highest initiative start first, but then it goes around the table. So you obviously can't, uh, you can't game that too much if you don't want to. But there's some fun stuff in here. Like, for instance, I mean, there's morale, but there's finish them. I really love this finish them mechanic. Basically, if the enemy fails the morale check and they are fleeing, the party can make a group luck check. And if they succeed, then they basically just eliminate the enemies. This is great so that if you've got a bunch of, you know, mooks running as it would be, you know, you don't want them to go warn somebody. You can just get rid of them, right? And also you don't have to play out this drawn out combat. And remember that every time you succeed in a luck check, your luck goes down. There's also rules for rallying your, your troops if, they, if their morale does break, your troops as it would be. There's all your different things, charge, intercept, withdraw. So you've got a lot of combat actions here. I really like this intercept move. Basically, if you effectively haven't gone yet and the enemy is moving in, so imagine your party's there and the the, the enemy wants to charge your spellcaster who's unarmored, you as a fighter can say, I'm going to intercept. If you haven't gone yet, you'll get to make an initiative check. And if you succeed, you basically get in front of them and stop them. Now, if it is the first round of combat, you do do it at disadvantage, but even still, it's a great thing to have in there. So many games talk about protect the spellcaster, protect the spellcaster, but they really don't give you any mechanics to do it. Stuff like this really helps. Then we've got chases. I rolled out a couple of chases just for fun, and they're really fun. This mechanic works super well. You basically, uh, you know, you do it in stages. You roll for events to see what happens. It really is a fun chase mechanic and nice and easy. Here we get into just kind of common actions and stuff to tell you like what takes a turn, what doesn't take a turn, all that. We've got our melee. I, I like some of this stuff too. Like if you outnumber the enemies, you get plus one. If you outnumber them three to one or more, you get plus two. That's so great, right? Simple and cool. So it definitely goes into detail where you need it. And again, where you don't need it, it doesn't. You've got dodge moves, critical hits. There's lots of cool little mechanical moves you can do here, right? But there's also three things that I would call very narrative in this combat that I really like. The first one is called minor exploits, and anybody can do one of these. Effectively, all you have to do is hit and cause damage, and you can do something else that's minor. Trip, push, that kind of stuff. Something that's only going to be temporary. 
So you want to push somebody, you attack, do damage, and make an opposed strength check. Stuff like that. The next category is major exploits, and these can only be done by PCs. This stuff is great. These are your heroic moments. The chopping off a scorpion's tail is one of the ones they give a, as an example, or finishing an enemy in one hit. What you have to do here is hit, cause damage, but then also make a luck check. If you make it, it goes off. Obviously, it's up to the GM whether or not it's you know can happen. And what's cool about this is, again, and I keep bringing this up, your luck goes down when you use it. So if it's super important to slay this enemy right now and they're low enough hit die that you can just slay them with a major ex exploit, well, maybe you burn that luck point. But later on, when you need to make that saving throw, you know, it's going to be a little bit harder. Finally, there's something that I really love. It's called the rescue. Once per adventure, a PC can basically rescue somebody. The example they give is somebody has a lightning bolt shot at them and they effectively would die. So one of the other characters, because you can do it, you know, it kind of breaks the, the thing. It's like, you can do it when it's not your turn. It's like, no, no, I'm going to tackle them so they don't get hit. You make the appropriate rolls. If you succeed, good to go. But again, it burns luck and you can only do it once. So do we want to rescue them now or later? Your choice, burn that luck. Now you've got fighting styles. It talks about one-handed weapon, two-handed weapon. You've got your visibility, underwater combat. Again, this is a very complete game. It conditions... This part right here is super interesting as well. Injury and death. So most attacks and damage and stuff in this game are considered scrapes and bruises. That's kind of how they describe it. When you get down to halfway through your hit points, though, you are wounded and will show that, obviously. This is true for both player characters and monsters. Generally speaking, the monsters, when they reach zero hit points, are dead. But player characters go into this death and dying mode. After the fight. So again, if somebody goes down to zero in a fight, they're down until the fight's over. So after the fight, assuming that the party wins or is able to take the body away, a check is made. It's basically a 10 or better on a D20. We use some modifiers and stuff. If they make the check, then they are dying. And if not, they're dead. So you have that kind of death save, if you will. Now, when you go into dying mode, effectively, they are out for one to three minutes. They come back with one hit point. You can put some healing magic and stuff, but they'll still be out for that long. So it's none of this like, you get knocked down to zero when you pop back up. I mean, that character is out for a bit, so it changes the strategy a lot. And if you reach that stage, it's time to roll on the injuries and setbacks table. So you've got your injuries and setbacks, right? And then you also have your trauma. So blade trauma, blast trauma, blunt trauma. And I love that it's divided by what it was. So we go into our healing and recovery. There's a really cool short rest mechanic in this, which basically is after a combat, you can take a few minutes to kind of make a few will checks, I believe it's two. And if you succeed, you can get things back. You can get some of your uh, class abilities back. You can, I think, heal some hit points maybe. Yep, it basically gives you a few options. Then you've got your long rest, which is basically seven days in a safe place and you fully heal. I like this a lot. One of the things I've said in the past when people complain about short and long rests in games is that I don't think they're the problem really. I think it's the over the top, so much healing available. This game doesn't have a ton of magical healing at all, so this makes a big difference. Sure, you can get some of your hit points back if you roll successfully after a combat with a short rest, and you get a hit point back, let's say, sleeping in a safe place and eating, but there's no way to go from, like, almost dead hit points to full hit points without taking a week off, really, and, you know, no easy way anyways. So I really like that. I think that actually makes the game a lot more grounded and feel a lot more sword and sorcery to me. Speaking of sorcery, <laughs> okay, so this is very cool. The way they do magic in this game is very interesting. There's only, I think, 100 spells. They're levelless, and you roll basically randomly to which ones you start with, and then you can gain them as you go up in level. You can only cast a certain number of times, you know, per adventure, unless you get the casting back, obviously, with short rests. And then in addition to that, you have to roll to cast. Now, roll to cast, you know, it depends on <laughs> if you like that or not. I don't always love it, but I think it works really well here because it's a check you're probably going to make because most of the time, so you're going to have a good chance of making it, which is nice. It's not just random. And also the magic is very powerful and you can use rerolls for it. So ultimately you've got that. Now, on top of that, you've got dark and dangerous magic. So whenever you use or try to use a spell, you basically roll a die depending on your level or what's going on. And if it gets a one, something over here happens. 
If it doesn't roll a one that time, the next time on a one or a two, something happens. So eventually it's going to happen. There is a buildup. If you keep casting spells, you're eventually going to have one of these weird things happen. And some of them are pretty bad, but some of them are simple, right? Whisper. You speak only in syllabant whispers for 1d12 months. So that's cool, right? It's just flavor. It doesn't destroy your character. It's not like, oh, you can't do anything. Some of them have tentacles come out of you. So there's lots of cool stuff that makes magic very, very unique and cool, but it's not just like, oh, well, I don't wanna play a magic user because if I roll bad, my character's ruined. So cultists have blessings and uh, rebukes. Basically, if you cast without favor, you might get one of these divine uh, rebukes, which are, again, similar to the other thing, but you don't grow tentacles instead you know, you like see the face of your deity or whatever and have some suffering from that. Some things require an atonement. So there's a list of atonements here. And you might see a theme here in this book that I'm really loving, which is you can roll for just about everything in this game. It's very much in the procedural domain. So, which makes it great for, and we're going to talk about in a second, solo play or even just play with a small group where you want everybody to kind of interact with the game as opposed to a more of a preset storytelling mode, right? This game really works itself into the emergent narrative vibe well. So here's your spells. Again, there's only a hundred of them and you roll, right? So you could end up, like if you're first level and you roll your first spell, you might get flesh to stone. You'll be able to turn somebody to stone. It can happen. Spells are dangerous and powerful, you know? So very cool. I like that. I love dangerous, powerful magic. Now we've got downtime. So here we get into the advancement, the way experience points work. And again, what I think this game does really well is it talks about you can have experience for loot, for combat, for exploration, for social. And then it tells you, it gives you a guide as to what you might give somebody. So it's not just vague, like, yeah, give experience points. It actually does give you numbers. So if you want to be more procedural about it, you can do that and you don't have to feel like you're arbitrarily making it up. So... We talk about how people can go up in levels. You got your hirelings and your pets. You've got black market trade over here if you want to get some stuff you're not supposed to have. You've got carousing, which can gain you some experience points and also create some really fun game situations. You basically spend some silver and then you roll on this table to see what happens and you do gain some experience points. There's some rules for gambling, very basic rules for gambling. Because as the game basically says, if the characters can just stay in town and gamble and be rich, why would they adventure? But you know, it's always, it's part of the, the, the genre. You've got your pets, you got your monstrous pets, you got ways to make potions. So there's probably not much that you're looking for in a game that's not in this one. You've got your recovery. Okay, so here we have persistent injuries, we have possible addictions, and we have madness. Now there is a whole section on madness and the author does go into it and talk about if the table's not comfortable using that kind of stuff, you know, just don't use it. It's not like it has to be used, it's kind of extra flavor. But it does talk about how if you see, you know, if you think of Cthulhu, right, you see some kind of terrible thing and it, it kind of, you know, makes your mind go, you can, you can recover from it with rest and, and those kind of things. Uh, we got magical research and standard research. You will probably notice, as, as if I've been noticing, there's blank pages and stuff here and there, because remember, again, this is a playtest version of this. And then we get into the GM tools. This is a great section here. Okay, calling all my AD&D first edition buddies. <laughs> no, here's your diseases and parasites, which again, can work if you're doing sword and sorcery in, in that kind of world, right? It's nice to add that grittiness to it, but you don't always have to add it, right? It's something extra you can add if you want. We've got great dungeon crawling technique here. This is only, I believe this is the entire, besides the tables, the random tables, it's just two pages here. Yeah, and this is fantastic. These two pages are worth reading the PDF just for it. It talks about the basics of dungeon crawling and how it works. The way they do the dungeon events is kind of neat. You're kind of count down, as opposed to rolling a random monster every two turns or whatever. You count down, dungeon tally they call it, I should say. They use chips or whatever, but you could use a die. And once it reaches six, you roll here, something might happen. Nice and simple, easy. This right here is a very big topic. And I'm going to dive into this a little bit deeper than I have the other sections, only because I think it's really good and something people are always looking for. So, Hexploration. Here we have a really nice travel procedure. It talks about roles that people can play in the party. It talks about how long it takes to travel. It talks about how you might run into various encounters, and those encounters are not always monsters, right? They're stuff. 
and we have rules to do it and nice and simple. So we've got our, the roles for the party. We've got what happens on the night shift and day shift. We've got, if they want to explore a hex, what could be there. We have travel events based on being overland, underground, or on a voyage. We've got weather, of course. And this is kind of interesting too. I've seen people talk about things like this in the past, how they handle this. If you're playing in a game and you want to always end back in town, but like you're running out of time, this is just a nice simple table to roll to say, hey, okay, you get back to town, but something happens. Now we've got our encounter tables. You got aerial encounters, city, town, village. And the way these are designed is the first, I don't know, maybe 10 of them or so are generally mundane-ish. And then you start getting into tougher stuff as it goes up. And the, what they have you do is you roll a d20 on this table during the day. And at night, because it's more dangerous to be traveling at night, you roll a d12 plus eight, I think is what it is. Then you might get elementals, mana cores. Again, you get the tougher stuff. During the day, you might end up just getting uh, a peak on a high mountain, you know? Okay. Got deserts. Jungles. So all your different environments, forests, mountains, hills, oceans, lakes. And again, I'm not reading through all these because this playtest is available. You can just grab it and read through. Underground. And then we get into hirelings. All right, so we've got rules here on how many hirelings you can have, how to find the hirelings, if they'll join your party or not. And then we've got some names, personalities, and traits. So you can basically whip them up. You can add backgrounds to them. Again, there's backgrounds in the build your PC section. So you can just use those. You've got what gear they start with. They might have a catchphrase, which could be kind of fun. Uh, and then this is what I thought was really interesting. Hireling advancement. So this isn't a very big section, but I think it really helps set a tone. Basically, when you're bringing people on, mercenaries and such, they're hirelings, right? If they survive an adventure, you roll 2d6 on the hireling advancement table. And they get things. They might get a class ability. They might get a piece of gear, et cetera, et cetera. But if you roll high enough on them, then they become a henchman. And at that point, they become a first level character loyal to the PC, assuming that they don't have any payback, which is another fun thing in here. If they're not treated well, there can be payback. <laughs> so basically, if you treat your henchmen well, or your hirelings well, I should say, and you get lucky, they roll to become henchmen, now you're getting classed characters to join you. This is super useful and it gives you a means to, you know, not just walk into town and pick up a third level barbarian every time you need somebody, right? You've got to kind of work these characters up. Now, that's not to say you can't meet NPCs that are leveled and recruit them, but I like that there's a system here where you can start with, you know, presumably, zero, it will come zero level people, and then they stick with you for a while, they become members of the party, it becomes part of the fiction, and then eventually they become your trusted henchmen. All right, here's the madness section. I already talked about it briefly. Now we've got our monsters, you know, kind of how the monsters work. If you're familiar with most role-playing games, it's pretty simple. They have, you know, they've got natural 19s. They do the deal where your the hit dice is their attack bonus, which I find to be super simple. I love that. How their special abilities work, what you can get from them as far as getting, you know, everybody wants to get the poison from the poison spiders, right? You've got a quick list here by hit dice and also how to customize monsters. And then we jump into some special traits. You've got a boss trait, so if you want to, let's say, have the party fight a single really tough ogre, let's say, as opposed to a bunch of ogres, you can boss them up. It tells you how to do that, basically giving them more hit points, and they get to make, like, attacks in between player characters' attacks and stuff. So if you like that epic boss fight, you can just take any monster and boss them up. There are some monsters in the monster section that are already bosses, like some dragons, right? But if you just want to take a monster you're using anyways, you could boss it up. Then we have general traits, like the demons... You have heavies, which are kind of like just better than regulars. People, they get some special abilities. Talks about immunity to non-magical weapons and such. Then we walk into things like, you know, incorporeal, lycanthrope. So it kind of gives you the breakdown of what stuff might mean, like generally. So you can craft monsters that you want. Then we have a large section here on monsters, basically. You've got your, you know, your animals. This is something I'm not going to go through that much because there's a lot of monsters in here. If there's a monster that you're looking for, it's probably in here. You got your demons, you got your elementals. And then we get to the oracles. All right, so we have two basic oracles here that we can use. This is Consult the Bones, which basically are two matching dice, twins as it is. This one here, which is the hammer. And then this one here sets our fortune. And what we can do is we can actually roll these dice. I'm just gonna roll them off the scene. 
Okay, yeah, actually you can see it. We have a yes, a blank, which means nothing, a blank, which means nothing, and another yes. So that's two yeses. That's a strong yes. So if we had had a question, uh, is there treasure in this room? Yes, right? <laughs> that's basically how that would work. The other one, which they talk about here, is read the signs. So you've got this deck of cards. There they are. As you draw two of them, so I've got victory, looting, glory, proud. Okay. The second one, fey, playing, capricious, misleading. All right. So let's say we drew those cards because we had come across a ruin, we'll say. So they, they come and they see these standing stones. And what's there but fey who are dancing capriciously around? The fey are going to try to mislead. The fey might try to mislead the player characters because there was a great battle here and there's all kinds of treasure, but of course the fey doesn't want the characters to have it because maybe the treasure is magical. There you go. You can basically put together a quick story using these cards. I think that they're super useful. And again, oracles are the kind of thing that are just there to help you. If you're playing solo, you kind of lean into it. But if I was at a table with my players, I might do the same thing. I might say, well, yeah, okay, you come across some ruins here and hand a card to one of my players and say, tell me what this means. And just let them interpret it. I mean, why not, right? What can it hurt? You can always veto it. <laughs> Doesn't say to do that, but that's what I would do. Anyways, you can determine your time using the cards and also direction, which is very useful. All right, jumping into a lot of GM tools here. Rival adventurers, so we have some basics and they tell you kind of how to run them so you don't have to create a whole bunch of rival player characters. It's kind of simplified, if you will. We have some rules for solo. Then we have a whole section here, which is great on traps, like some philosophy of traps, basically why you'd have traps, how they operate, stuff like that. But then also danger levels, triggers, mode of attack. And you can actually roll these up if you want or look at it and go, okay, here's what we got. There's even cost if you want to put them in your own place. Like here's a poison traps, rolling boulder, snare. Then we have our treasure. So treasure here is broken up into different types. So you've basically got carry loot A and B, valuables A, valuables B, trinkets and curios, lair treasure, minor magic, and major magic. So you roll on the table, tells you what's there. A lot of it's got flavor, which is nice. And if you roll high enough on it, you can sometimes jump to the next table, which again is also nice. It's a feature I like a lot. And let's see what else we got here. This is all treasure. We've got lair treasures, which are the bigger treasures. We've got minor magics. We've got, which you know include potions. And then this is kind of neat here. Old magic grimoires. There are 12 of them here. And these are basically powerful spells. So it's like another way to add spell casting, but you need to cast them from these grimoires. We have charms. Then we get to our major magic items. So what they do here is kind of interesting. There's 20 listed in the book, and obviously you can make up your own. And what happens is when you first get it, you must attune to it and you get the one of its powers. Then as you level up and use the item, the more powers are unlocked. Again, in a world where you're not going to have a lot of magic, this is a good way to do it because you may only find one magic item in your entire adventuring career. So it's cool if, I mean, for as a player character, maybe not as a group. So it's cool that that magic item keeps getting better. So you're not just like, well, okay, I got this plus one sword and that's all I have. I mean, there's no plus one swords here, but basically they're all very flavorful and they all power up as you level up. Give me an idea of them. We're almost at the end of the book here. And yeah, then here we just have some variant rules. So it talks about changing things up. If you play with smaller parties, if you want to make it less deadly or more deadly, if you want to do different class abilities, it's got some basic rules there. So I definitely need to take a moment to thank Stephen at Pickpocket Press for asking me to do this. What a great system. You know, there's a lot of new systems coming out constantly, and I have... <laughs> My shelf attests to the number of systems I've bought. And one thing that I'm looking for more and more as time goes on is something that truly has a voice. And I think this does. I feel like with Tales of Argosa, you know what you're getting. When you sit down to play this game, it's not just another version of D&D with some house rules. There's definitely some flavor here that sets it down a path. Now, it's not so baked in that you can't play in different ways just because you like the system. But it's definitely there. It's in the tables, it's in the classes, it's in the way magic works. You really get this sword and sorcery feel. It's the kind of thing that if you're playing lots of different games, but you want something that feels different, has its own voice, and is robust, I think it's definitely worth looking at. 
As I said, the playtest is down in the show notes. You can grab that for free. Check it out. Join their Discord server. Let them know what they what you think. It's going to be going to Kickstarter very soon. So again, in the, the description there, you're going to find a link to where you can get on the list. So when it's launched, I'd love to know what you think about this. I'm sure some of you have played it. This is not something brand new. It's been in the wild for a while. They've been playtesting it for a while. Have you played low fantasy gaming? Have you played using this playtest? Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. I'll talk to you soon.